around of the sources and the material and seeing whether beyond the tangible and visible items in archaeology we can follow the gaze of Ippi, the upright snarling hippopotamus form, the protected goddess. She looks across to the west here to the restored 12th century mosque at Algila uh, in Libya. So I will be discussing some points of uh, rather hypothetical nature and I'll be opening questions for my fellow panelists and for you in the audience uh, to consider where you think there is potential in moving in this direction. I'm moving into, if you like, what has been in Egyptology, the empty quarter. Uh, in uh, the archeology span of Middle Kingdom Egypt, the period I study, the red dot on the map is very famous, the site of El Lahun. So we've zoomed in directly into the Sahara where the Nile, the longest river, cuts through the desert, the largest desert. It's just 100 kilometers south of Cairo where Fayoum Governorate opens up. And here a cluster of archeological sites includes the gold work from the Royal pyramid complex of King Senwazret II, some of the finest ever produced in the jewelry workshops of the ancient Egyptian palaces, Egyptian palaces from any period. But we will be concentrating a kilometer the east of the pyramid where the king was buried in the 19th century BC, because there an equally precious and perhaps even rarer survival greets archeology. span the extraordinary preservation conditions, which are not typical of ancient Egyptian towns, mainly in the flood plain, here just raised at the edge of the desert, ensure the preservation in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and in collections in this country at Manchester, at the Petrie Museum, UCL, and around the world, that give us different uh, experiences of the material culture of 19th century BC Egypt. So in our hunt for cultural exchange, we're looking, in my case, not so much at the left side, the jewelry of the map, which is a part of the question, but I'm thinking of the perhaps more elusive um, industries and crafts, um, not only the organic materials, but across the whole spectrum of archaeology. So that will be my target. Now it's problematic because the town site was cleared before stratigraphy was developed in archaeology. So Petrie, Flinders Petrie um, from Bromley, uh, not far from London, uh, is the person who employed a group of uh, um, youth locally from the local villages in the Fayoum area to remove the earth that had preserved the site so that he could plan the site, which is in itself an extraordinary find. It's one of the finds of Lahoon, Petrie's ability to draw this plan, everyone still refers to and tries to explore, if like uh, my colleague Kathleen Cortay, who will be speaking uh, later in the conference, and Florence Diane, and Zoltan Horvet from Budapest also, he showed in recent fieldwork how much potential with meticulous archaeology the site might still have to uncover the places from which Petrie extracted his finds. Meanwhile, we have those finds to work with in the museums, including the papyri. So there are two large groups and they indicate different registers of language, of the speech chat, the speaking that happens in exchange. They are monolingual. There is no foreign papyri, as we'll see later in uh, the uh, later periods of Egyptian history. This is not a Greek Coptic Arabic world of the late first millennium. It is not the Greek and uh, Demotic Egyptian world of the late first millennium BC. Uh, here we have Egyptian words, Egyptian speakers, Egyptian language, but in two registers, one 
if you follow the terminology of the literary philosopher Bachtin, uh, you might call monoglossic, a single-minded purpose. And that's the orange circle. This is the material from the temple accounts, um, all for managerial business. From the temple, nothing to do with the religion except where they mention festivals, as we'll see. So we're going to be looking a little more at the red circle, the large area, without exact provenance, it is true, but a singular world dated by its handwriting to the late 19th century uh, BC, um, early 18th century BC. These are the random scatter of papari from the town. So uh, in this uh, um, selection, the most famous example of the um, uh, Outsider, the exchange, is the document uh, at upper right here, where four Aam women are brought from one person to another. We don't know what that means. They're given. It's, the document is called an exchange. These four women, two adults and two children, in some way move from one official to another, from a brother, as it happens, to another brother. And then the lower document shows how a few years later, we don't know how many, maybe 15, maybe 20, the same four women, according to the document, given by his brother, are handed over to the wife of the receiving brother. So these women, who are identified by the word Aam, uh, and some have Egyptian names, some apparently not Egyptian names, they are transferred twice. As a European in London, as a Northern European, it's very difficult for me to start interpreting. Uh, we have to be very careful, we have to open the field of interpretation to other uh, voices. So it is not appropriate for someone in North Europe to talk uh, about the peoples of Africa as they move um, with assumptions about how that might work. You must look at the words, you must look at the document in itself and think all of the different possibilities and that's why this kind of uh, public uh, conference is so important to invite in beyond the academia which has its own monoglossia, its own monolingualism, um, a wider range of voices. So how do we approach them? The Egyptological instinct for women Aam is a common ethnonym in the 19th century BC in Egypt. And where non-Egyptian names are associated, they seem to belong to the neighboring Eastern Semitic languages of peoples um, in Western Asia and maybe in the Eastern desert of Egypt. And so the Egyptologist is prompted automatically to the famous scene 100 kilometers south of Al Lahun, a generation or two earlier in the early 19th century BC, um, where there is the four, a group of four women, there's a child old enough to walk, there are two children either not old enough to walk or tired, and uh, in front of them a group of men, all of them wearing um, uncharacteristic clothing. So textile is taking us for this ancient Egyptian artist, Zeus and Cohen has warned us not to overinterpret, and she cited all the different interpretations of this scene. So I very strongly recommend before anyone tries to make connections that they have a look at her um, article on how many different versions of uh, connections uh, there are in Levantine archaeology. And uh, I'll keep that in, in, um, in mind. I'm not going to say these are a particular group of people. Um, but I'm interested in something that David Wengro drew attention to when he was looking at Mediterranean exchanges, and that's the dimension of gender. So for me, both the document from Lahun and the wall painting of Beni Hassan um, remind us, with the women and the children and the men, of gender and age dimensions as formulated in formal Egyptian art and as formulated in this legal document. We have to remember, as Susan Cohen says, the context. If we were looking at that wall with the four women and we turned right, this is not just a monolingual environment, but purely monoglossic in the sense of Bakhtin. This is a tomb chapel 
with a purpose, a singular purpose. Everything here, this extraordinary work of art and architecture, is for the eternal life of the governor of this part of Egypt, who also had responsibility for the Eastern Desert, a man called Shemhotep. So remember this, if you haven't had a chance to go to Egypt, it's one of the most overpowering centers uh, you can stand in the center of this offering hall and looking at the perfection of the art achieved with palace artists um, in this province of uh, central upper Egypt. So we'll turn back to the wall now and the men in front of the women and they're fronted at the front by two Egyptian men in their white linen clothing and then you have a man uh, leaning at an ibex given the title and name Hillland ruler Ibsha and behind him a man who's not named and a caption that says I paint is the core aim. The exchange here is I paint a religious, a cosmetic, an aesthetic uh, dimension of ancient Egyptian life. And 37 Ha'an. And the man in the front is offering the document confirming that caption. So, where are we? We're on one register on the wall of many registers, the wild animal hunt in the desert above, the more important, the nearer, lower registers showing the great cattle count, so domestic and wildlife. And on the right, we have the standing figure of the governor himself. So the line of figures is walking directly into the face of the sight of um, the most important person in this monoglossic environment. And because we know from the excavations by the French Institute de Gadozet and uh, um, under uh, Georges Cassel and Georges Sikassian, um, we, we have the exact spot where the Egyptians marked their extraction of Galena, the eye paint, in the ground. And it's on the same latitude as Beni Hassan. The man with the authority there, he has a political and a military authority that reaches over to where these people are. We also know that the Egyptians themselves are extracting Gabozet because we have inscriptions at the site that Castel and Sukhiasian um, have published with Isabel Jean. So here, 100 kilometers south of Lahoum, we have some quite um, strongly emphasized visual exchanges, and yet we don't really know what's going on. Are the Aamu, these people from the East, these perhaps Semitic speaking peoples, languages are not people, ethnonym and uh, language name not necessarily the same. That's just how they're filtered in the Egyptian description. Um, but is this an exchange? Did they just happen to arrive together? Is it kind of like a double benefit to the governor in an exciting way that's recorded by the document brought by the king's secretary? These are open questions. So with that kind of image in mind, let's go back 100 kilometers to Lahoon and see the finds. The one example, of a foreign language at the site, or at least a foreign script, because not everyone agrees how to read it, is this Hedelchuk. The Hedelchuk is an Egyptian tool, and we know how it works because they showed us in another monoglossic environment for the afterlife, but here no words, just a three-dimensional model. This is from a hundred years earlier, from the burial of the treasurer Mekhet Ra. And here, thanks to Winlock's uh, wonderful publication, if you didn't know what a heddlejack is, they show you where it's used within the textile equipment. When you use a horizontal loom, which is the normal loom of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, um, you um, need this uh, for the support. So you can see on the plan at the right side, you have two larger ones for the larger loom, two slightly smaller ones for the smaller loom. It's exactly what you find in the archeology span of Lahoon. You go to the museum, you'll find some fairly coarse wood examples, uh, like the large uh, one in the left of the picture of the other heddle jacks, but some finer. And the spindle whorls that survive in much larger numbers with these drum shapes, some of those have been analyzed by Carolyn Cartwright in the uh, British Museum, and she showed that they're coniferous wood. Uh, very uh, correctly cautious uh, identification, just as much as we can um, uh, uh, think is uh, uh, safe to say. But in general terms, the closest source for that conifer used for the world would be Mount Lebanon. So it doesn't mean that the 
objects were shaped, the, the, the material culture is still Egyptian, like the Hedel track. These are Egyptian textile implements. Maybe these are just offcuts from arriving timber from large scale sea dirt. But this is where they come from, from Mount Lebanon. Uh, the one of the remaining cedar groves reminding us of just the vast area of forestry um, that survived up until uh, early modernity um, on the slopes of Lebanon. And we know also from the papyri at Lahun that the place uh, of the, um, the, the point of departure for the cedar, um, uh, Gebel, um, the classical name is Byblos, the ancient name is Kepani, we know that that meant something in Lahun. There's a model letter on the left. You can see the original photograph of the original where the writer invokes Hathor, the lady of Kepani. And when you go to Gebel, Kepani, Byblos itself, you see the um, obelisks in the temple show Egyptian form. You might think obelisk is a general shape, but one of them even has the inscription in hieroglyphs of the local governor. And you follow through to the other finds. And this is what makes Gebel, Byblos, different from other sites in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we may, in our cultural exchanges, want to look for nodes of a particular um, strength of contact. And we want to look at both the, um, um, the industrial, if you like, and the palatial. There are different social registers here. This is where the papyri become interesting. It's not only the jewelry, which is there. Um, you have uh, an example of a pectoral, just like the ones you find in Lahoon, um, the same uh, shrine-shaped style. You have the scarabs of a governor of uh, Kepani with a non-Egyptian name, Inten. And then I think most surprising because the date of the uh, royal tombs at Byblos with this Egyptian material is disputed. I think Robert Schiestel's article on the inlays from the coffin in one of the royal tombs at Gebel is crucial. Uh, this is not looted material. In this particular instance of the coffin inlays, you don't loot a cedarwood coffin with its inlays. Uh, it's hard to imagine how that would work. You loot the metal, you loot the precious things, um, the jewellery. Um, so, no, this, this ruler went into the ground with a classic Middle Kingdom rectangular coffin with wedge eyes, the two um, wedge eyes uh, shown there above the scarab base. Uh, that means something. So when we're looking for the evidence in archaeology of the cultural exchange, um, if we can look out and listen for the registers. Obviously with the pottery, that's something much more familiar in um, archaeological uh, studies, distribution maps. So when Petrie published his finds of the few decorated pottery items from Lahoon town, now we can analyze that. Mike Hughes did the neutron activation analysis of um, the ceramics in the Greek and Roman department at the British Museum, and we can pin it down. So yes, there's a handful from Minoan Crete across the Medi uh, Mediterranean. There is even the last one that was identified, so after everyone had identified the Cypriot and the East Desert and the new work by Zoltan Horvath, Matthew Petrik showed that there are also things that Petri missed, a Nubian pottery from the valley and from the Nubian desert of the Medjai, uh, if they are the Pangrave people of the time. So the arrows are there to show you there are a lot of the red and blue are the direct links and then beyond that think of what's going further. The last one to be identified was number three. Um, looks vaguely Egyptian, the spiral vaguely northern, which is why Petrie thought it might be um, Minoan. But the where it, it, it was difficult to identify until Deborah Darnell from her fieldwork in the Western Desert, going back to the gaze of Ippi, looking west, the Western Desert. And this is important. Um, we will see in, in, in a moment, uh, as I'm, my last point for this uh, presentation, um, it's important because we can almost never see it. It's the invisibility, it's the intangibility. That I'm, it's not in itself Libyan wear, that little shirt. Um, I thought once that there was another example, you'll see in my abstract of the paper, that um, I thought this document, which is a rota of dancers and singers um, at Lahoon, at the temple, um, I thought one of the broken words, either extraordinary edition by Francis Griffiths in 1898, uh, one of the very few words he couldn't read. So that's one of the ones where we, we, we try harder. And I thought it might be Wahatiu, uh, Oasis Men, but it's not. It's the word translated here as watch. 
um, the Oasis men disappear. What we can see is Aam again, connected with here only Egyptian names. So they're acculturated. They're called Aam. They're identified as outsiders, but they have Egyptian names and their parents have Egyptian names. And then the dancers um, also include the Medjai. Now, some of them have Egyptian names, but one of them doesn't. Uh, Kufu, or maybe two, Kesu. So here you have different levels of acculturation, which I would like us to uh, keep an eye on. So we can plot in that very general way from the red dot on the map out eastward to this lands where area of lands where people spoke um, Semitic uh, languages and maybe others. Aam is just the way that the outsider Egyptian put a name on the area. Who knows about the diversity within uh, the groups? Uh, that's for archaeology to step in. Um, we think that the Medjai are the people attested from the eastern desert. So we have that eastern area. What's going on on the west? These elusive oasis dwellers with the two sherds. They come from Dakhla Oasis, so still within the Egyptian sphere. I'd like to invoke one paper here um, by um, the speaker coming after me, um, Professor Clark, uh, on the relation that's always there between the Nile flood plain and the uh, peoples of the desert, or at least the desert as an environment. So every year the Nile would flood until the great dams were built the beginning in the uh, later 20th century at Aswan, the Nile would flood. It might kill you if it was too high, it might kill you if it was too low and you didn't have food. If you, the flood uh, was not uh, high enough for uh, uh, leaving silt and uh, supporting agriculture for the next year. So it was a moment, as Fekri Hassan has said, of intense anxiety. It was an annual pandemic. Every year you waited for this moment when you didn't know how your next year would be. You might plan for it, you might store, but this is why you have this outbursting of celebration as the goddess Hathor herself, we met in Byblos, kept me before. Um, and I think that's what the very festive decorated but purely Egyptian Nile flood silt um, on the top right is, is, is hinting at. And uh, uh, Jochen Krak has uh, um, republished the, um, and drawn attention to uh, one Ptolemaic inscription where the animals of the desert and the peoples of the desert from all sides point to the far mystic southeast. Uh, the Asians, the Aamu, and then maybe the, the Libyans in, in the West. People are coming in. The fertility comes in from the outside. So I'd like us, when we come across a little inscription, actually with the word oasis dwellers in the Middle Kingdom, uh, top left, uh, Kunta Burkhardt, and then uh, uh, the late Michel Bro and Colin Talley, published one inscription at Dakhla on a road which is now very important. It shows that the, the ancient Egyptians in the Middle Kingdom and the Old Kingdom are going further south and southwest into Africa uh, uh, than, um, than had previously been appreciated. Um, so we have that one little word, that one little inscription, but how are we going to look out for the other places? So I'll finish on this general point that the, the uh, Riemann first emphasized, you might have a, a map of points, but we don't have an archaeology of the desert roads yet. So if you have today the dromedaries coming across for Afro Oasis, still very difficult to plot that route archaeologically. And this is where the new archaeology there is so exciting. And I'd like to add to that a, a historical dimension. This is something that hasn't gone away in Egypt. So the very first person who hosted Flinders Petrie at his excavation, or his survey at the Pyramids of Giza, was a man called Ali Chabri. And later, when Petrie was digging at Naukratis and the Defenna in the Delta, um, he uh, was talking to the nephew of uh, um, Ali Jabri, and he extracted a kind of a family tree, he found out that a couple of hundred years earlier, the ancestors of Ali Jabri, and this was a memory they kept in the family, um, had left Ein Jalou, the place with the 12th century restored mosque, the Attic Mosque in uh, Algeria, I showed you at the beginning. Someone's already looking out across that uh, desert, the, and if you zoom a bit further out, um, more generally, if you like, atemporally, putting space before time, which is a hard thing to do in archaeology because we're in a colonial manner predisposed to put time before space. But if you just step out, keeping Lahoon, the red dot on the map, and just thinking from the upper Egyptian Nile Valley, 
when you're looking across. How do you get across? We now know that they can, that near area within the modern border states, of the, uh, borders of the state of the modern state of Egypt. Um, but what then happens there? If the people of the Nile Valley stop there, how much um, further do the people they encounter there go, and how much further do people after them? And this is where you need the new meeting, not so new meeting, with the archaeologists of the Sahara, like the great so European-funded projects uh, led by David Mattingly. Um, or um, the work by Riemann first to themselves on desert roads, uh, out across to the other side, not just to the state of Egypt, but to the state of modern Libya, far into the, the desert. And I think the people who connect us already are the archaeologists who work in the rock cart, because the map there shows you it's already the Nubian Nile Valley, uh, the mountain uh, across uh, through to Libya, right through to uh, the Dajrat Akakus Massif in the middle of the map, the southwest of Libya. So there are commonalities already being explored. The Nile is something like the steppes of Asia, of Eurasia. It's a, um, it's a place that invites in its own steps, and the Sahara are the steps for the Nile. So we have to think about uh, space of exchange and the vast territories that were covered in a different way. And to uh, remind ourselves that over history, in this comparative context, there are many moments when the Saharan space pours into the Nile Valley. The Sahara connects West uh, Africa and uh, the Nile Valley, whether it's the pre-dynastic population of uh, Egypt, whether it's the defeat ultimately of New Kingdom Egypt, by the Libyan wars and the Libyan rulers, whether it's the Fatimid conquest of Egypt or later um, the movement of the Hawara Bedouin who are still so prominent uh, in Upper Egypt. There's a long-term history that from our little points I'd like to look at without pretending it's easy. We don't know how many people moved and when people seem to change, is that a large number of people or a small number? Uh, Gramsci used the uh, key term of prestige and linguistics to talk about the magnet of success. You, you emulate, you're out of all of your great grandfathers and great grandmothers, who do you select the most successful one? So you get these genealogies with a partiality of the family tree. And uh, the recent uh, addition of exactly the area of Fayoum, but in the 13th century AD by Nablusi, the addition by Yosef Rappaport, um, fully analyzes those questions. We all also have to think about that. How many people are moving, the quantitative? So those are the questions I'd like to take to this extraordinary harvest of material finds from Lahoum, thinking not so much just what are the materials and the techniques, but who are the exchangers? Something like the mat from Lahoum, maybe 19th century BC, is part of a tradition. Someone like Ahmed Eskelani in the uh, modern arts of Egypt will be using that tradition in his own way to make his own statements uh, 20 years or so ago about the contemporary country. Um, the, the unemployed figure bumped over and the under the, the official standing tall. Um, so I'd like to know an open question is where do you find these cultural exchangers? How many are there and in what social context might we identify them? Those are my questions from Lahoum. Thank you very much.